<laughs> Welcome to a special Discover Ag interview. We are coming to you live from Fishy Fisher Family Vineyards. That's a mouthful. In Napa Valley, California, we are here with Perk, better known as the Propane Education and Research Council, to celebrate Fisher Vineyards receiving the Perk's Energy for Everyone Heroes Award. Fisher Vineyards is the first winner of this exciting award, and we are so honored to be here helping you guys celebrate. Yes, we are so excited. We have been touring the vineyard all morning and learning more about how propane is helping agriculture uh, across the nation just be more sustainable, efficient, and profitable. But for this conversation, we want to focus on right here what's in front of us, grape growing and winemaking. So we are excited to be joined by Mike Newland, who is Director of Agriculture Business Development at Propane Education and Research, and Rob Fisher, who is the CEO of Fisher Vineyards. Mike, Rob, welcome to Discover Ag. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. So before we get into how you guys are using propane and being more sustainable, Rob, this question is for you. When we were getting ready to come here, I was fascinated by your family story and the history of this vineyard. And so maybe briefly tell us about how you guys got started um, and, you know, the two different vineyards that you have here um, and just a little bit about your family background. Right. I'll I'll try to keep it succinct here. Um, (laughs) Uh, I, I, I was actually born into the business. My parents had founded in 1973, so we celebrated our 50th anniversary last year. Um, our my, my parents actually uh, met on a blind date in San Francisco, had nothing to do with farming at the time. They both had research uh, and service industry jobs. And the one thing they shared in common is they wanted to leave service industry and make a tangible product. So they started looking for vineyard land or land to plant in the early 70s. Um, My father had first fallen in love with wine uh, in a mountainous region and had this vision that mountain vineyards have to be different, more special because the vines struggle to grow and 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 ripen there. Uh, so they first bought land high up in the Mayacamas Mountains of Sonoma County, about 100 acres uh, in the mountain region that divides Napa from Sonoma, planted a third of that. And the, the, the challenge planting that mountainous vineyard led them to also buy vineyards down here in Calistoga, where we're sitting today, uh, north end of the Napa Valley. We have about 60 acres of, of vineyard down here. Um, so my two sisters and I grew up in the industry, uh, came back one by one. Uh, we have a sister, Whitney, who leads our production side of the business. Uh, I have a sister, Cameron, who leads marketing, and I lead the business side. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting earlier when you're talking about having dual locations and how that was, uh, whether it was from the you know pro side of that or the challenge side of that, I, it makes you guys really unique um, in the winemaking, grape growing industry. Uh, and so I, I really enjoyed, like I think, learning that difference. You know, Tara talked about coming here, learning about your guys's history. One thing that stood out to me when I was coming here, I kept thinking, gosh, what does propane and, you know, wine have to do with each other? Like, how do those two pieces of the puzzle fit together? And I quickly learned they fit together actually quite nicely. You guys are using propane rather robustly here on your guys's uh, farm ranch. Uh, so maybe talk to us a little bit about that. Um, but before we do that, I actually want to have you talk to us about why, because you mentioned kind of being in California, there are some things with the grid and wildfires. And I was just absolutely shocked about kind of your guys's introduction and, and um, maybe reasoning of why propane is so important to you guys here. Yeah, our first introduction to propane was on the farming side in our vineyard. So we're what we would refer to as an estate grown winery, meaning we we grow all of our own fruit and and then process and vinify and make our own wines and brands. Um, so we first embraced it in the vineyards where we need frost protection. Um, early in the spring, as the vines come out of dormancy, we have to protect them from cold air that settles on the vineyards. And uh, our, our acreage is obviously widespread. So we need uh, fans that can be powered uh, spread across this large footprint. So we started with propane in the vineyards as frost protection used in the spring season. And over decades of being comfortable with it in the vineyards, when it came to the power disruptions that we've experienced around fires starting almost 10 years ago now, um, you know, we needed to find a way to develop more resilient power. Everything we do is incredibly sensitive to the timing of a process and temperatures, all of which require power. And so we turned to propane for our backup power generation um, that handles both, you know, HVAC as well as our hot water, um, 
Uh, we use it for material handling of our forklifts as well. But interestingly, we also uh, use that same hot water source to uh, heat our fermentations during harvest. So there's really critical stages where we we can't operate without resilient power. And, um, and we're having been comfortable with it uh, in the vineyards, thought it was the perfect opportunity for backup power for the winery. Mike, this question is actually for you. You know, as you're hearing all this, obviously Fisher Vineyards is not the only vineyard that's dealing with the power grid and uh, or the lack of power at certain critical times, as Rob mentioned. So are you seeing more adoption of propane in these kind of maybe like out of the box ways, like beyond just, you know, in the actual vineyards and now in the winery? We, we absolutely are. And, and Rob stated what their introduction to the energy source was. Propane powers those fans at an incredibly high percentage rate. Uh, that market really is dominated by our fuel, uh, probably to the tune of 95 plus percent here in the United States, maybe even 98 plus percent in the United States. All those fans are run by propane. But specifically to your question on power, we absolutely are seeing more and more situations like this. Over lunch, we were talking and um, the power grid is uh, not only the instability is one thing that we have to overcome with, with backup, but the price here uh, for power is something that I think a lot of folks around the country would not believe what they pay for electricity. So, um, you know, we were, we were having a conversation at lunch and, you know, Rob talked about they may be looking to expand how they use that power in the future again. So, um, there's a lot of folks in the area that I think are taking a look at it. We do a lot of incentives on new equipment in the, in, uh, in the space with propane. So we are able to track the, um, the uptake of the technology and, uh, we're exactly seeing what you, what you asked about. We're seeing more and more power go to propane. Yeah, it's it's funny. I have a little list here I want to read because I think we all have um, an initial idea of how we use propane and how it is used. And the widespread use of it just blows my mind, especially after visiting the vineyard. But uh, when we're looking at the farm, you know, irrigation engines, generators, water heating systems, building heating systems, flame weed control systems, agronomic heat treatment system, forklifts, skid steers, more and more and more. And I we're just, as you kind of mentioned, starting to see, um, you know, as leaders in agriculture, how we can harvest this kind of when it comes to sustainability footprint. Absolutely. And, and a couple that aren't on the list, you know, um, grain drying obviously is huge in other parts of the country from where we're sitting today. But, um, you know, we dry hops, uh, the hops market out here in the in the in the western part of the U.S., all the nut uh, crops that come off get dried with propane dryers as well. Uh, so we are a, um, a big part of agriculture. We love being that big part of agriculture. Uh, I think we've got some great solutions and you're going to see some new products come to market. Uh, we were visiting a, a project that we've helped fund out here in California. We're injecting soil, uh, steam into the soil to control weeds and nematodes right now. And uh, that technology is incredibly promising. And uh, we really have a commercial unit today that we could sell today. So that's super exciting. I feel like if there's one thing that never ceases to amaze me is all of the different things going on in agriculture and all the pieces that you never think about, like just like that. I mean, that's really incredible, the technology that's coming out of it. Something else I had never thought of, and Rob, this question is for you, is, you know, you talked about actually during the key times of operation, how you need to use propane and how you need to keep things operating if you guys have been evacuated because of fire. So fires are obviously a concern here. We've see, all of us, even outside of this area, have seen them in the news. Um, but I had never thought about that. Like, how do you keep your operation and running. And so for you, you said one of them was like, you have to mix. Uh, you're going to explain this better than me, but I think the seeds and the skin of the grapes sit on top and yeah. the juices are underneath. And you need somebody to make mixing those to keep that amazing wine flavor. And, you know, propane is a piece of that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it all comes down to power for us. So during harvest is when we see the greatest number of and duration of power disruptions. Um, and it, it, it's often warm, um, during that, during harvest. Uh, and so we need our barrel room to stay chilled. Um, we can't have our, our barrel halls warming at all. Um, and then as we get grapes in going into tank, we start fermentations. We constantly need to be, uh, working those fermentations with pump overs is what we were talking about, combining the, the, the juice, uh, with the skins and, and seeds during fermentation. So, 
when when we're evacuated, if we can have reliable uh, backup power, all systems up, we're able to actually control those fermentations and manage them from a distance, um, even when we're evacuated, and and be able to manage that, you know, keeping our our buildings climatized and our fermentations moving, which is critical. You talked about the barrel room, and I just have to say, walking into your barrel room was maybe one of the best smells I've ever smelled in my life. I took a video, and I, I was like, I wish I videos had like a scratch and sniff feature because it was pretty. It was something, something to experience. That's great, scratch and sniff. We would love it. It doesn't exist. You could find a <laughs> bottle of Fisher Vineyard somewhere and pull the cork. Um, but yeah, please, you know, I hope hope more people will come out and visit us. Hopefully, during a a, a, a cellar movement where you can you can smell that. Yeah, I'm so glad you actually brought that up because um, I do think sometimes people want to learn more about agriculture or the different processes when it comes to, you know, making their food and, and how it gets from start to end. But they might be a little like more hesitant to do so. And like you said, like you can just come out and immerse yourself. And we're all learning. <laughs> you know, Tara and I grew up in agriculture. You think we'd get here and we know a few things and we 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 knew absolutely nothing. And it was really fun. It's funny that Tara brought up the barrel room because that was actually one of my favorite rooms as well. I just was blown away actually about how much you were talking about. Um, and maybe you can share some with our disco listeners. You know, the, the barrels are aged for an X amount of years and then they're, they're like hand fired for an X amount of years. Like the process was absolutely standing. And that was just one key component of making wine. It was the barrels. True. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we do our piece of agriculture, but there are other adjacent industries we rely on that are ag related ag involved. And one of those is uh, the timber market, growing the timber for the barrels, which is then harvested, air dried for three years, milled, uh, kiln fired, essentially over fire uh, the interior of those barrels um, as they take shape and then uh, make their way to us. And and so absolutely, it's, it's astounding how many different pieces come together in that one room. And uh, there is nothing like it. I once heard from another winemaker. We, we talked about this. Winemaker is correct terminology. Is that right? That I did. Good. Okay. That's good. I talked to another um, winemaker who said that one of the cool things about being in this is, you know, a lot of agriculture doesn't ever interact with customers or consumers, but you guys do. You have a tasting, you know, if you have a tasting room, if you, you know, just anytime you're crack open a bottle, it seems like people ask about the wine and all of it. And it must be like, a, I think, a really cool piece of agriculture to be a part of, to be able to have those conversations with people. It's true. It, it is unique that we are, uh, well, first of all, that we're in a state, a state grower with the winery on the vineyard is a really immersive experience for people to come, not just taste the wine, but see the farming happening. Um, and literally within, you know, uh, a, a, a short visit, be able to experience everything from the ground to the process, the barrel, and then the finished product out of the bottle. Um, it's it's so true that so many other ag components maybe show up on the dinner table, but when you, you, you don't have a consumer experience to go chase them back and be able to experience them in their element the way we can do that with wine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, because we've talked about propane's reliability. Uh, Mike, I'm hoping you can jump in and talk a little bit about the sustainability portion of it, because that's obviously one of the big reasons here, and we're going to get into the award that, you know, Fisher, your family has um, received today, which is very exciting. But maybe let's just, like, dabble in the sustainability portion of propane, because, again, I think, you know, I, I leave today being like, winemakers are doing a lot and propane is doing a lot. <laughs> so maybe talk about some of the sustainability key, you know, key points maybe when it comes to propane. Yeah, I think one of the cool things that people may not think about is you have the ability to store our fuel. Uh, so you're, un, you're, you're unhitched essentially from any grid in that respect. Uh, and I think that's key. It's key for Rob, I think, in his operation and others around the country who are in the same, you know, the same agriculture space would understand that who are our customers today. So you have the ability to buy ahead. You have the ability to store as much volume as you want to or need to on your farm. And then we've got obviously a 3,500 um, customer, excuse me, companies that are supplying you on the farm whatever farm year looks like uh, around the country with our fuel. So I think that's key. When we get to sustainability, and we always have this conversation, especially here in California, propane is incredibly clean. Uh, we don't get the credit for that. I think a lot of times people want to lump us in with fossil fuels and diesel and things like that. And oh my gosh, it's not even a fair comparison. Um, carbon intensity of, of the propane that we're burning uh, you know, today is about 80 
uh, on the on the CI scale. And um, you know, it's going to get cleaner in the future. We know that it is. We're producing renewable propane today, and um, you know, depending on the on the source of where that propane renewable propane comes from. Um, you could be in the low teens on carbon intensity today, and we absolutely believe and feel that we're going to get to car uh, to to net zero uh, in the future. Maybe a decade, but I think we're going to get there. Um, so it's exciting. Uh, we are always up for a debate about how clean our fuel is. We'd love to talk about that. Uh, we'd love to tout the fact that I think we're the cleanest energy that's commercially available for sale today, hands down. We're cleaner than the electric grid where we're sitting today. Um, so, um, you know, Rob's, Rob's, um, decision and the, and the decision the fishers made to go with the backup power, I think is a great one. Obviously they have to have power when they need it, but also it's a cleaner, uh, power that they're buying off the grid. No, absolutely. And Mike, we've interviewed you before. And so if you guys are interested in learning more about that, we can um, link that in the show notes as well, that previous interview where we really deep dive all of those conversations. But to wrap things up here for us today, um, we want to say, you know, we're here because of Perk, because of propane and the fact that the Fisher family has won such a prestigious award. Um, As we said, this is the Energy for Everyone's Hero Award. And I think it's really incredible what uh, Perk is doing to be able to highlight, you know, your customers, like Fisher Family Vineyards, uh, what they're doing to be more sustainable with propane. So thank you guys both for being on. Thank you for having us out today. Um, It was absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure our discos, our disco community, uh, loved learning about this just as much as we did. Thank you, guys. We're excited.